O nature and O soul of man, how far beyond all utterance are your linked analogies. Not the smallest atom stirs or lives on matter, but has its cunning duplicate in mind. In the 18th century, America experienced a series of religious revivals, collectively known as the First Great Awakening. In 1739, the English evangelist George Whitfield crossed the Atlantic to Philadelphia, where he struck up a partnership with none other than Dr. Benjamin Franklin. The collaboration of Franklin and Whitfield is illustrative of the relationship between the American Enlightenment and the coming Romantic Revolution. Benjamin Franklin was unquestionably a man of the Enlightenment, whereas Whitfield seemed to anticipate the romantic preoccupation with a unique sense of self, individualism, and subjective experience, particularly experience of the divine. Franklin himself noted, after attending one of Whitfield's sermons, I happened soon after to attend one of his sermons, in the course of which I perceived he intended to finish with a collection, and I silently resolved that he should get nothing from me. I had in my pocket a handful of copper money, three or four silver dollars, and five pistoles in gold. As he proceeded, I began to soften and concluded to give the coppers. Another stroke of his oratory made me ashamed of that and determined me to give the silver. And he finished so admirably that I emptied my pocket wholly into the collector's dish, gold and all. Even though they did not see eye to eye on religious matters, Franklin being a rationalist when it came to religion, they cooperated with a mutual belief that society could be improved, either by reason and science, or by religious revivalism and the inward changing of individual hearts. Like its European counterpart, American Romanticism would not be a rejection of the Enlightenment project, but a continuation by other means. Romanticism became one of the first literary movements in the new United States of America. Charles Brockton Brown's gothic novels, like Wieland, became an influence for Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus. Washington Irving transplanted European folk tales to American soil in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle. And James Fenimore Cooper, whose frontier romances, The Leatherstocking Tales, led to his being dubbed by Victor Hugo, the American Walter Scott. The greatest influence on Herman Melville was Nathaniel Hawthorne, whose Puritan romances took the movement in a dark direction, largely as a response to the transcendentalists of New England. After the War of Independence, Unitarian theology became dominant at Harvard Divinity School. An example of the influence of Enlightenment thought, Unitarians dispensed with much of earlier Christian doctrine and held to a belief in one rational and benevolent God. Transcendentalism grew out of the Unitarian milieu of Boston Common and served to supplement the reasonable faith with a more subjective emotional experience. The leader of the Transcendentalist school was Ralph Waldo Emerson. Emerson, who came from a line of New England ministers going back to Puritan times, instead fashioned himself into America's first public intellectual. Emerson's philosophy replaced the absentee landlord god of the Unitarians with an eminent pantheistic god that he termed the Oversoul. For Emerson, nature was the ultimate sign of this divinity, not scripture or revelation, and all one had to do was go out into nature in order to find communion with the divine. Every spirit builds itself a house, and beyond its house a world, and beyond its world a heaven. Know then, that the world exists for you. For you is the phenomenon perfect, what we are that only can we see. All that Adam had, all that Caesar could, you have and can do. Adam called his house heaven and earth. Caesar called his house Rome. You perhaps call yours a cobbler's trade, a hundred acres of plowed land or a scholar's garret. Yet line for line and point for point, your dominion is as great as theirs, though without fine names. Build therefore your own world. 
Taking Emerson's gospel of self-reliance to heart, Henry David Thoreau set himself up in a cabin amidst woodland owned by Emerson near Walden Pond to demonstrate that communion with the Oversoul was achievable by anybody. Another transcendentalist social experiment was the ill-fated Brook Farm. Founded by Unitarian minister George Ripley in 1844 as a stock company in which all members would share in the work and spoils, Brook Farm floundered and eventually went under in 1847. One member in particular, a young Nathaniel Hawthorne, became disillusioned by the experience and would come to satirize the whole affair in The Blythedale Romance. Hawthorne's turning away from Emersonian idealism would lead to his turning towards a dark romanticism that would powerfully influence Herman Melville. Hawthorne and Melville were neighbors while Melville resided at Arrowhead, his small farm in the Berkshires, during the writing of Moby Dick. Hawthorne and Melville had much in common. Both would find employment with the U.S. Customs House. Hawthorne held his position until the election of the Whig president, Zachary Taylor, whereupon Taylor's Whig allies ousted the Democratic Hawthorne from his position as a customs agent. It was during this period of unemployment he set out to write The Scarlet Letter. Ironically, the novel may be the most lasting legacy of Taylor's 16-month presidency. The Scarlet Letter is Hawthorne's most well-known work and the best example of his Puritan romances. The novel took the romantic emphasis on passion and the emotions and used it to explore the internal agony caused by sin and guilt. The adulterous romance between the protagonist Hester Prynne and the Reverend Arthur Dimsdale is meant to be symbolic of the fall of the first couple in paradise. But Hester Prynne, with a mind of native courage and activity, had for so long a period not merely estranged but outlawed from society, had habituated herself to such latitude of speculation as was altogether foreign to the clergyman. She had wandered, without rule or guidance, in a moral wilderness. The Scarlet Letter was her passport into regions where other women dared not tread. Shame, despair, solitude. These had been her teachers, stern and wild ones, and they had made her strong, but taught her much amiss. It was under the influence of Hawthorne that Melville would transform his Essex-inspired sea story into a dark, romantic masterpiece. So strong was Melville's admiration for Hawthorne that he dedicated Moby Dick to his literary mentor, and upon receiving Hawthorne's praise for the book, he replied, Your heart beat in my ribs and mine and yours, and both in God's. It is a strange feeling. No hopefulness is in it. No despair. Content. That is it. And irresponsibility. But without licentious inclination. I speak now of my profoundest sense of being, not of an incidental feeling. Whence come you, Hawthorne? By what right do you drink from my flagon of life? And when I put it to my lips, lo, they are yours and not mine. I feel that the Godhead is broken up like the bread at the supper, and that we are the pieces. Melville's own romantic experiment came with his early novels of the South Seas, in particular, Typee and Omu. As hard as it may be for us to imagine now, in Melville's lifetime, he was more famous for these works than Moby Dick and the lovely Fayoe was far more recognizable to Anglo-American readers than Ahab ever was. Melville's first novel, Typee, which was loosely based on his experience of jumping ship on the island of Nukuhiva with a shipmate, centers around Tomo, a protagonist not unlike Ishmael, who comes to admire the culture of the islanders. Though he finds their religion bewildering, he considers them to be noble savages, more Christian than many self-professed Christians, and he strikes up a romance with the beautiful Polynesian girl, Fayoe, whose innocence suggests that she is the new Eve, herself with Tomo as her Adam. Bubbling just under the tranquil surface of the island society is a darkness that Tomo eventually flees from. Though the islanders may appear innocent, they practice cannibalism, and Melville sensationally describes the experience of seeing human flesh still hanging off the bone at one of their feasts. Melville, like Hawthorne, would come to reject the Emersonian view of nature 
and instead embrace a darker vision, one of a cruel and cannibalistic natural world, far more in line with the vision of the Marquis de Sade than the fur cap wearing Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Even amiable Queequeg, the noble son of an island chief, is soon overtaken by a fixation upon his impending death, leading him to order the building of his coffin, a coffin which, ironically, will ensure the survival of his friend Ishmael at the novel's conclusion. Consider the subtleness of the sea, how its most dreaded creatures glide underwater, unapparent for the most part, and treacherously hidden beneath the loveliest tints of azure. Consider also the devilish brilliance and beauty of many of its most remorseless tribes, as the dainty embellished shape of many species of sharks. Consider once more the universal cannibalism of the sea, all whose creatures prey upon each other, carrying on eternal war since the world began. Consider all this, and then turn to this green, gentle, and most docile earth. Consider them both, the sea and the land, and do you not find a strange analogy to something in yourself? For as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man there lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all the horrors of the half-known life. God keep thee, push not off from that isle, thou canst never return. Despite Melville's rejection of transcendentalism, Moby Dick features two main characters who are undoubtedly Emersonians, Ahab and Ishmael. The novel's narrator, Ishmael, resembles Shakespeare's Hamlet more than he does a typical old salt. The bulk of the novel consists of his contemplations of all he sees around him. Yes, as everyone knows, meditation and water are wedded forever. Aside from being the Pequod's resident philosopher, Ishmael's other role is that of the artist. In Chapter 3, the owner of the Spouter Inn refers to him as Scrimshander, or someone who carves Scrimshaw onto whalebone and teeth. As he enters the inn, he becomes fixated on an oil painting that is so chaotic he cannot immediately make out what is being represented. Ishmael eventually concludes that the black mass on the canvas is a whale rising above the masts of a whaling ship. This innocuous scene at the novel's opening signifies Ishmael's role as the artist, one who draws form out of chaos. Throughout the novel, Ishmael's narration brings order to an otherwise chaotic situation, even going so far as to classify the kinds of whales encountered using terms referring to the size of books, like folio, octavo, and duodecimo. It is Ishmael, as narrator and author surrogate, who transforms the disaster of the whaler Pequod, like that of the whaler Essex, into a symbol-rich prose epic worthy of Hawthorne. Melville's greatest creation, however, is the monomaniacal Captain Ahab, whose quest to destroy the white whale that took his leg drives the plot of the novel. Ahab's speech is inspired by both Shakespeare and Milton, and his character is purely Emersonian, self-reliant and refusing to accept any masters above him. Echoes of the transcendentalist search for ultimate meaning beyond the outward signs of nature can be heard in Ahab's response to Starbuck's protest of the quest for the white whale. Vengeance on a dumb brute, cried Starbuck, that simply smoked thee from blindest instinct. Madness! To be enraged with a dumb thing, Captain Ahab, seems blasphemous. Hark ye yet again, a little lower layer. All visible objects, man, are but as pasteboard masks. But in each event, in the living act, the undoubted deed, there some unknown but still reasoning thing puts forth the moldings of its features from behind the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask, how can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me, the white whale is that wall, shoved near to me. Sometimes I think there's naught beyond, but tis enough. He tasks me. He heaps me. I see in him outrageous strength, with an inscrutable malice sinew in it. That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate. 
and be the white whale agent or be the white whale principal, I will wreak that hate upon him. Talk not to me of blasphemy, man. I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. For could the sun do that, then could I do the other. Since there is ever a sort of fair play herein, jealousy presides over all creations. But not my master, man, is even that fair play. Who is over me? Truth hath no confines. The clearest parallel to a Shakespeare character is Macbeth, as both he and Ahab come to believe in their own roles as men of destiny, and both fatally misread accompanying prophecies. Macbeth believes he cannot be slain in battle after the witches assure him that none of woman born shall harm Macbeth, only to discover that his conqueror Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. Likewise, Ahab's dreams are interpreted by the fire-worshipping Parsi, Fadala, who tells him that before he dies, he must see two hearses, one made not by human hands, and the other made of American wood. Finally, Ahab is assured only him can kill him, which he takes to imply hanging from the gallows, and not the whale lines likened to fate by Melville in the novel. While romantics admired Shakespeare for his glorification of the imagination, dark romantics like Melville understood that while imagination was to be celebrated, it was also the source of evil thoughts, such as those that turned Scotland's great captain traitor. For mine own good, all causes shall give way. I am in blood stepped in so far. Should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as go over. Strange things I have in head, that will to hand, which must be acted, ere they may be scanned. Ahab's own dark mind is fixated on the pursuit of the white whale, and he will not turn from that course. His demonic quest is comparable not only to that of Prometheus the Firebringer, a favorite of romantic poets, but also Milton Satan in Paradise Lost. This comparison is made explicit by Melville himself, as he describes a Catskill eagle folded into the Pequod's flag and dragged down with the sinking ship at the novel's conclusion. And so the bird of heaven, with archangelic shrieks and his imperial beak thrust upwards and his whole captive form folded in the flag of Ahab, went down with his ship, which, like Satan, would not sink to hell till she had dragged a living part of heaven along with her and helmeted herself with it. Like the Transcendentalists, the Dark Romantics also saw God in nature, but not in the tranquility of Walden Pond, but in the eye of the storm. Ahab, like those touched by the Great Awakenings, will seek out the Divine, but his quest will be an unholy pursuit of God. We will conclude our analysis of Moby Dick with a theological reading of the novel in Part 3.